Holy One, may thy word only be spoken and thy word only be heard. Amen. Please be seated. It's a great joy and pleasure to be worshipping with you today. I bring you greetings from Toronto. And this morning I want to look at a passage from uh, Luke's Gospel particularly those fir that first sentence, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Don't be afraid, little flock. Images come to my mind anyway of the shepherd, protective and caring, keeping us safe from harm, maybe even slipping the crook around our neck and pulling us back if we wander off into what seems to be those greener pastures. Now, I wonder what images come to your mind. Maybe you find them comforting or maybe you're actually not too keen on the idea of having your neck crooked and being pulled out of greener pastures. But what of the second part? The kingdom that our Father wants to give us. Every week we pray, thy kingdom come in the Lord's Prayer. But what does it mean? And what does it look like? And this is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. In last week's gospel reading, Jesus is in the middle of speaking when he is interrupted. Now, as I said at the earlier service, you probably heard this, but there's a joke about how pastors react when they're in mid-flow and somebody interrupts them. It's never good. And maybe that's why Jesus seems a little curt in his response. He tells a parable of the farmer whose only concern was for his own welfare. He looked to his own wisdom. He looked to see what he would do. He talked to himself. His advice didn't help him very much. I'll build bigger barns to store my grain, he said to himself. I will eat and drink and be merry. God said, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. He couldn't take all his grain with him. And now he had to face God's judgment, not because he had all this grain, but because of the greed with which he planned to hoard it. When we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we have to balance the reassuring words of the caring, protective shepherd, of the Father who knows us, knows what we need and loves us, with the judgment that we will all face. The Old Testament reading is a hard reading. But God has not changed. He loves and he judges. And we are in his hands. So this is the question, how are we living the life that he has given to us? Are we being changed into his likeness, albeit slowly and with some discomfort? Jesus said, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Pretty good so far, but then comes the kicker. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Sell our possessions and give alms. Possibly your least favorite topic for a sermon. Well, maybe giving alms is all right, but selling our possessions? Jesus was talking to his disciples, most of whom probably didn't have many possessions. But there was a large crowd, thousands, we are told. The disciples, we know, they were working, some of them. They had homes. And even Jesus had a common purse to support his ministry. Though putting Judas in charge of it, I always thought was an interesting choice. In general, though, this am amassing of possessions doesn't seem like a good idea. If we have children or grandchildren, we may reason that we are keeping stuff to pass along to them. And indeed, there may be one or two things that they would really appreciate. 
But I was speaking with an antique dealer here on Friday afternoon, and he was telling us that when his son moved out into his own apartment, he didn't have anything. And so his parents said, he's got this antique business, take a look in the warehouse. You can take anything that you want. Do you know, the father said to us in an astonished voice, he didn't want any of it. Everything in his apartment is from Ikea. <laughs> For those of us, Ikea does make good furniture, although it probably doesn't last hundreds of years. But for those of us who are pondering such things, my hunch is that probably most of our children don't want most of our stuff. We know what granny silver means, but they don't want to clean it. They don't have a long history with Aunt Agatha's heavy bureau, and they've got nowhere to put it anyway, and they certainly don't want all those China tea services and ornaments. My guess is that, like the antique dealer's son, what they would like is for us to sell all that stuff and take them to Ikea, or maybe a trip to Hawaii. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't actually say that in Scripture, though. More likely, help others in need who don't have a home, or enough food, or few, if any, possessions. When I look around at all the things that I've gathered, and then see pictures on our TV of the refugees who run with only their clothes on their back, I think, I sure have amassed a lot of possessions. And what am I doing with them? So the question is, how are we living our lives? Is our security in all our possessions and the things that we build around ourselves? I doubt that our Lord's primary concern is what we do with Aunt Agatha's bureau, but he does care about how we live our lives, how aware we are of the lives of others. A quick read through Luke and we see again and again Jesus saying, don't be afraid, don't worry, don't be anxious. All that worry cannot add a single hour to your life. And we in this crazy 21st century know that worry and anxiety is more likely to take the hours from our lives. Jesus' primary concern, I believe, is that the disciples learn to live into a new life, to the new covenant, to turn to him, to focus on him, to trust him for today and tomorrow, for life now and life after death. These are troubling times. As I said, I've just come down from Toronto in Canada, and we ha we're a little concerned about what's happening in a, the southern land. <laughs> Who do you trust? Our politicians, you know, cannot protect us. Walls, no matter how high, cannot protect us. Guns and nuclear arms cannot protect us. Savings in the bank, health plans, retirement plans, land and possessions cannot protect us about, from the one 100% guarantee we are all going to die. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> what we can be absolutely sure of is that God longs, longs for us to reach out to him, longs to take our hand, for us to put our trust in him. Henry Nam once pointed out that in order for us to take God's hand, we have to let go of those things that we hold on to too tightly. When we let go of them, we can take his hand. My little granddaughter, as I said again earlier, you knew I was going to be able to sneak her into the sermon <laughs> somehow. She's recently learned to walk. And in the back garden um, at my daughter and son-in-law's home, there's a hill. And she can, now she can manage to walk up the hill. But she can't walk down it yet. So when she stands at the top of the hill, she reaches out, and either me or her dad or her mum take a hand and we guide her down the hill. It's a lovely image of trust. Now she's taken a tumble, and she knows it doesn't feel good, and it doesn't do anything for her grandmother, I can tell you. But she knows that if she reaches out her hand, that she can trust the one who will hold on to it and lead her down the hill. You know, Jesus longs to do that with us. He tells us not to worry and not to be anxious. I confess to you, I am a worrier. I do try. And sometimes I try to imagine what life would be like if I stopped, ca 
carrying all those things, those worries and concerns, not in an irresponsible way. Most of us are not being called to throw everything away and go somewhere. But in a way that says, I am willing, Lord. In a way that says, I trust you. As I get older, I find myself more and more asking, what am I to do in the years that I have left, however long they may be, or short? Am I living the life that you want me to lead? How much do I trust? On a personal note, when I left Warrington at the beginning of this year, I was not sure of the future, but I had some pretty good ideas of how I thought it might look. But bit by bit, and painfully, I should say, I'm having to let go of my own agenda and tune into what God wants me to do, wherever that might be and however that might look. And how it might look is that I may be here a little more than I had planned, but I have to say I'm really enjoying it. I don't find it easy. As Ben said, it's hard living in two worlds. But I know above all things that I want to be living into the call on my life to be God's disciple. Because if I don't want that, then why am I here? Why am I standing here? Why are we here? I keep an eye on St. James on Facebook and others, and I see all the amazing things that you guys do in the community. You are a gift to this community. But do we trust God when we see others struggling Do they see in us the trust that we have? Trust for our future, for our homes, and especially if none of our dreams and plans and schemes come to fruition in the way that we might wish. The reading from Hebrews, that beautiful passage that Linda read for us, a whole other sermon there that I'm not going to preach this morning. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We don't know. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know how it looks. We do know that God does not renege on his promises, though we may not see them realized in this lifetime. The selfish farmer in the parable that Jesus told did not trust God, did not consult God, did not pray to God. But God had the last word. Ultimately, you and I will all come face to face with Jesus. And how will we fare when he turns his loving gaze on us? Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've run the race well. Each day is a gift, a gift from God. How will we use it today? Today, can you bring those thoughts and prayers, dreams and plans those problems and worries, those addictions of ourselves or our families, failings and fallings, all the things that preoccupy and distract. Can you imagine maybe bringing them to the cross when you come forward for communion and leaving them at the foot there? Imagine how free you'd feel when you walked away. Your hands are free now, free to put them into God's hand and to let him guide us up and down those hills, through the valleys. <coughs> Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen.